Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Hi, we're good. good. How are you? Good, good. Y'all ready for a, a, a great episode? Yeah, super excited. <laughs> Absolutely. We got a super special guest today, and, and I'm not even going to belabor the, the point of, of any, any weird intro like I normally do. Uh, so, Kiana, <laughs> please introduce today's guest. So joining us today is a former first daughter and granddaughter, best-selling author and talk show host. She's here to discuss the inspiration behind her best-selling book, Everything Beautiful in Its Time, available tax-free at shopmyexchange.com. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Jenna Bush Hager. Hi, hey. everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Jenna, it's an honor having you with us today. Uh, can you let our viewers know where you where you joining us from today? You look like you got a pretty good yeah. view back there. I know. I <laughs> wish I could actually move my computer to show you because I am calling in from New York City. I'm in 30 Rockefeller Center. So right behind me, if I could move my computer over, you would see what is now a skating rink, a roller skating rink, but it's where the Rockefeller Christmas tree is in the in the winter and the skating rink. So I do, I have a great, great view. So thank y'all for having me. It's one of the benefits of the pandemic is that we can talk even if we're far away. Absolutely. And Jenna, we are coming um, to you from Dallas and you and your twin sister, Barbara, were in town on Sunday to promote your new children's book, The Superpower Sisterhood. How was it visiting Austin, Houston, and of course, Dallas? Yes, it was great. Barbara and I am looking for the book, but I don't have one in here. Um, Jess wrote a children's book. It's called The Super, well, y'all have it. Of course you do. Y'all are organized. The Superpower Sisterhood. <laughs> and it's all about, actually, it's kind of inspired by our mom who was an only child. And in fact, her first memory is being in a children's hospital in Midland, Texas, and looking through the plexiglass of, um, of in the NICU of a little baby, a boy that they named, they named him Edward because they knew he wasn't gonna live. And they wanted to save the name Harold, who is my grandpa, Harold Welch, uh, for a baby that would. And so, and she never had a sibling, you know, my grandmother had three stillbirths or three um, babies that died right after being born. And so um, she always, my mom's first wish on a star when she was little, her dream was to have siblings. And of course that wouldn't come true, but she had this great group of friends um, that she's been best friends with since she was a little girl in Midland, Texas, and they are her sisterhood. They actually go to a different national park and hike every single year. Um, they took us along once, but they never have again. And um, <laughs> I wonder why. Um, but, you know, it, it really shows that sisterhood comes in all forms. You don't have to have a twin sister like me, which is the luckiest thing in the world. You can also have friends. I mean, I look behind me. There's a picture of Hoda and me. You can have friends or colleagues who make you feel brave and powerful and i hope you all have that i feel i have a feeling you do <laughs> yes no sisterhood but is a really important like, thing i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you i didn't even tell you what it was like to be in texas it was great oh, yeah. um, I, I'm, <laughs> but I'm a homesick texan um i love tacos and queso um and i miss them so much because actually there's not great mexican food here in new york city but it was fun i mean i one of the things that I love about Texas is that the people are generous and kind. And I got to bring my little girl who is nine years old, um, Mila, she just turned nine. She's in third grade. I got to bring her to see her grandparents and come down and, and hang out in Texas for the last couple of days. So it was really fun to be there. No, and we're sorry you missed you, Jenna, but hopefully next time we can, we can catch you on your, your next Texas visit, for sure. Yes, 
please. <laughs> So you also grew up in a family of writers. Um, you've mentioned that journaling each morning after losing your grandparents kind of helped you sort through your emotions. And from those moments of journaling, everything beautiful in its time was created. So what is the inspiration behind the book's title? Yeah, oh, that's such a good question. I It, is, it did, it came from, the book itself came from um, the year after I lost my three remaining grandparents. So two of whom y'all probably know, they have airports named after them, Barbara and George Bush. And then my other grandmother, whom I'm named after, Jenna Welch. And I think even though I was very much aware how lucky I was to have them for so long, it doesn't make the pain hurt any less. And so I was grieving with my entire family and, and also in the case of my, my famous grandparents, some of the country you know and that felt at first kind of weird but then it felt really good because people remembered them so the the first time i started journaling actually was when my grandmother barbara passed away and my husband was out of town my kids were little and i got into bed um after i heard the news and, and my husband actually landed in Dallas and he said for a board meeting, he said, I'm going to fly. And he got the news at the airport. He said, I'm going to fly home. And I said, no, no, you know, I'll be coming to Texas in two days. Stay there. It's it's OK. Um, but I got in bed and I turned on the news. And of course, like when you were the former first lady, a lot of you, you have news reports about, about her death and in memoriams, people talking about her. And although. Um, it was a little weird, to be honest, and nobody really spoke about Barbara Bush, the grandmother, of course, because they didn't know her that way. They talked about her as the politician's wife. And so at some point, I just turned off the TV and I wrote to her a letter. And it was not for any reason. I mean, I knew she wasn't going to read it except to grieve. And I found during that year, which was hard, writing, journaling, um, made me feel better. And in some ways they were letters to the people I lost um, because my grandparents, all of them loved to write letters. And obviously I knew they would never read them, but it just, it helped me get my emotions out so that then I could, you know, come to work or I could be a present mom and a joyful mom. Cause I, you know, I want to be, that's my goal. Um, and everything beautiful in its time. One of the things that was kind of interesting is that my grandparents had such different my grandmothers in partic particular had such different lives and also deaths, burials. My grandmother, Barbara, had a huge public funeral and there were women on the side of the streets in Houston wearing pearls to honor her. And then my grandmother, Jenna, you know, she was 99. And as my parents said, when you're 99, not that many people come to your funeral, which is such a blessing, you know, to live that long. Um, but it was really just my parents, my sister and me, and a few others. So it was maybe eight people at her funeral. My parents wrote the service, including a, a Bible verse from Ecclesiastes. And that is everything is beautiful in its time. And I feel like when I heard that, when I read that, which is a, you know, a verse that I've known that we had studied growing up um, when I was younger in church and then, you know, in a Episcopal school I went to and I heard it but for some reason it took on this new meaning for me because at that point I'd already lost my grandmother Jenna was the last one to die and so I'd already lost my two other grandparents I was pregnant with a baby boy who I knew would never meet these people I loved and I just I wrote my dad I think read it at the service and I I was like oh even pain even grief um, becomes beautiful because in order to grieve, you must have really loved the person and, you know, reliving beautiful memories. Um, and, and so I, it was, that's what I hoped this book would do would be for anybody that had lost somebody, they might read it and think, oh my gosh, there will be joy. There will be love again. There will be, um, happiness. And so that's, that's what the title means. That was a very long way of saying it. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. And uh, and you know, you mentioned your grand grandparents or your your grandmothers specifically. And uh, for me, my my grandmother was 
probably what well, was the most influential person in my life. So I can absolutely relate uh, to to losing somebody that that you know impactful to your life and and uh, being you know being able to write that down and and get those emotions out. I don't I don't know if that I've written it down or tried to figure out how to how to kind of process that even you know after 15 years. But uh, yeah. you know you sharing that story uh, hits hits me a certain way, which I know it's probably hitting a lot of other people a certain way. So thank you for for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and the readers can definitely relate to your moments of vulnerability uh, throughout the book. And you even included a partial list of times that you cried in your life. And so what made it motivated you to share your story of love and loss with the world? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, Staff Sergeant, I feel like so many of us, like, and both of us are so lucky because we've had our grandmothers into our adulthood. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I feel like yeah. that's one of the cornerstones of that everything becomes beautiful. It's also like, you can't believe we had them so long that it hurt so bad when they were gone. You know, for example, my husband's dad passed away during COVID. So my, how my baby who's just two now, you know, won't remember his granddad. And so in so many ways, I'm like, wow, I can't believe. And when I hear you talk about your grandmother, I know you must feel this way, like how blessed, how lucky we were to have them for so long that it meant losing them hurt so bad. You know, we had such great relationships with them because I, what I come to realize is when you lose, you know, I was in my mid thirties. So I'd known them as a little girl. I'd known them as a teenager. And then they got to watch me get married and have kids, meet my kids. So all of those relationships, um, you know, were like many little relationships. And I think that is what makes it so special. And so I'm sorry for your loss, even after 15 years, I know that it still hurts. And, yeah. and I do think writing about it is writing about her, you know, even would feel good because it's fun just to remember, you know, that's the beauty Absolutely. of it. Um, and as far as sharing everything, well, as far as crying, I mean, I'm on TV every day. I cry all the time. I cry when things are funny. <laughs> I cry when things are sad. I cry when things make me happy. And, um, I think, you know, one of my grandpa, part of this book is like a list of rules written and unwritten, you know, like the ways they lived uh, and, and actually also very tangible rules that my grandmother, Barbara typed up on and would put on the back of our doors to remind us, you know, to would teach us respect and courtesy, um, simple things like pick up your towels, like don't leave dirty clothes on the ground. You know, I'm sure y'all are familiar with oh, just yeah. Yeah, yeah, learning how to treat people, you know, and that's what she was trying to do, even though they just seemed simple. But my grandpa actually wrote a list of rules that he lived by and they were less, you know, sort of things you could do, but more how you act. And so some were, um, you know, nobody likes an overbearing big shot. That was one. Um, one was talk less and listen to your friends and mentors, which I think, you know, is about learning, continuing to learn. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a lot, there were maybe 10. One was don't be afraid to cry when a friend is hurting. And I, and my grandpa was a crier for sure. And my dad was a crier and I'm a crier. And I think back like how lucky my dad was to have a father who said, it's okay to have emotions, you know? And this yeah, was in absolutely. the 1950s. That was a long time ago, 40s, 50s. So um, I think that's why my dad is such a good father to Barbara and I is that he was allowed to feel as a little boy, he was allowed to hurt. And I think sometimes you know, uh, and I'm sure some of y'all can relate with this, like men are taught in a, my, like husband even says that he remembers, you know, learning and sort of, he went to an all boys school and it was kind of strict that he was not supposed to, he was supposed to be tough. He wasn't supposed Absolutely. to feel. And that's a hard thing to reconcile later when you're an adult mm -hmm. and you're like, wait, but my feelings are hurt or I am happy. So I want to cry or I, you know, and I think it's something we need to teach our, I'm cognizant of teaching how, the same emotional skills that I teach my girls, which is it's okay to hurt, you know? And I think it's kind of like woke isn't the world word, but it's kind of amazing that my grandpa included that as a rule, you know, and he was born in 1925. So, no, um, 
yeah, I wrote a list of all the ways I cried. I mean, I think vulnerability is helpful to other people because it makes you feel not so alone. And I didn't write this book before COVID. It came out in April of 2020. But I mean, you know, during that time, and I'm sure all of y'all can remember, it was a very anxious time. You know, people were, and it was also, we were collectively grieving. You know, there were, I'm sure you all know somebody that died because of COVID or died with COVID. And then, you know, even just the simplicity of feeling alone and being lonely was really hard for people. Um, and so I think it's important that we are allowed to feel. Um, and that's something I'm so glad my, my grandpa taught us all. Yeah. And, and I am a big yeah. crier too. <laughs> okay. But, but, show, but, but showing emotion shows that you're human. And so I think yeah. you can connect with people on a, on a, on a deeper level, if you can actually show people that you're actually a human being. So uh, yes. thank you for, for, for sharing those, those vulnerable moments with us. Sure. And the book sheds light into your upbringing, faith, and especially what your grandparents, former President George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush taught you over the years. What are some of your fondest memories growing up with your grandparents? Well, that's such a good question. I mean, I think one thing that people might not be surprised by, but slightly, is that, um, you know, our grandparents were around a lot, you know, and and even to the, um, I mean, this is a fancy occasion, for example, at an inauguration, but <clears throat> I, on the road this weekend with my sister, we were reminded of a time, and this is wild, it was the it was the night before a debate that my grandfather had versus Michael Dukakis. And you would think he'd be spending his time studying or prepping or in meetings or whatever you would do, you know, to prepare for that. But instead, and since then we've been like, mom and dad, where were you? But instead he and my grandmother were bab babysitting little Barbara and me. Um, we went to the vice president's house. My parents dropped us off. I'm like, well, did y'all have a date night? I don't understand. Like, couldn't you have gotten a babysitter? But we stayed with my grandparents. And I think it, that it says everything, right? I mean, we didn't know that he was president. I mean, my sister actually thought that all grandfathers had inauguration. She looked back into her journal from first grade that she wrote, you know, in school. She has her diary or journal that was a school assignment that we wrote in every single day and she said she got home from you know we've seen it we looked at it and died laughing she thought that all grandpas were celebrated so we went to the inauguration it has balloons and i mean you saw that picture we were all dressed up there were like linda gale was singing on the stage there's <laughs> a parade there's all sorts of pomp and circumstance that as a little kid feels super cool you know and so she thought because our grandfather was so humble. And in fact, his biggest, his biggest, I guess, attribute was humility. And if you looked at his list of rules, that would be at the very top. He had a mom who, I mean, drilled it into him in a way that was sort of like, now you're like, oh, poor little Gampy, you know? Like she would say, don't brag about yourself. You know, don't, why would you say that? And it just when he would come home and say, I, I hit a home run today, like he'd get in trouble for that. And so I think because of her, he just found humility to be the most important important cornerstone. And so he treated everybody the same um, and also put family first, like really, you know, I mean, it's one thing to say that, but it's a perfect example that the night before he had a huge debate, we were there and we were in first grade kindergarten. We were like little kids who needed uh, activities and Barbara lost her stuffed cat. Um, and I went and cried to him and I said, can't be Barbara can't find spiky. She can't sleep. I was like her little lawyer. And so he spent the <laughs> night with secret service in tow with flashlights looking for this stuffed cat. He didn't find it. They found it the next morning, but I think it's like the perfect example. I mean, he, we will got to be with them. He never acted like his job was more important than us. Um, and I think that that's, and, and the other thing about him, because humility was such a, was such a um, cornerstone of his life. I mean, really like the most important quality to him, which is not everyone, you know, he, we didn't know a bunch about him. 
he didn't brag. Like, for example, we when he was uh, last, you know, a couple years ago after my grandmother had died, we would take turns reading to him. And that actually includes some of his letters that he wrote to his mom or to my grandmother when he was deployed during World War II. And, and, and we could only read that side of it because as some of you probably know, he was shot down. So his letters that he received, we don't have access to, but those letters that he wrote, we love. And in some of them, for example, we found out he was good at everything. He was like the captain of the baseball team and soccer team and um, basketball team. We didn't even know he played. We knew he played baseball. We didn't even know he played soccer or basketball, you know? And then the other thing we found out was that when he was a high school student, he, it was the first time he ever, and he writes to my grandmother about this. He first time he ever disobeyed his parents and his parents wanted him to start college before he enlisted um, to fight in World War II. And he lied to them. He went down to the recruiter's office and he lied about his age because I think he was 17 or something. He was too young to enlist. Mm. And so in one of the letters to his moms, he said, make sure that you know you tell those other moms not to tell anybody my age, because he was so worried that he would end up being you know called out for being too young to enlist and um you know he went on to be the youngest uh naval aviator in world war ii um but that for example was something that he wouldn't talk about freely because to him it would sound like a brag but of course we want to we want to know that about our grand we, you know we we want to know who he was so that like to have those letters feels like a real gift and to be able to read them to him um, before he passed away was was such a beautiful thing to be able to do too. No, that is really special. Um, and speaking of letter writing, um, not only was your grandfather and grandmother on your father's side prolific writers, but so were your mother's parents mm -hmm. as well. And so how much of their writing inspired your writing style? Yeah, yeah, they were. I mean, my grandfather, and again, I think this was sort of signs of the time because both of my grandfathers fought in World War II. Um, my, my grandfather, Harold, who's from West Texas. Um, so, you know, the letters we have were their love story. Um, so he would write to his mom and also to his, to my grandmother, Jenna. Uh, and so, you know, and I, there was this picture that I love. I wish we had it of my grandmother. She took it kind of in a old time, um, bathtub and it was like it was like she sent it to him i mean it was kind of like a sexy picture you know um <laughs> and war and i still love that picture my, my mom like framed it in her bathroom because it just you know it says so much about their love story and how much she wanted him to come home um but i so i think you know it's it's hard because it's it's my grandfather for example never wrote a autobiography, a lot of presidents, you know, my dad has, President Obama ha has, um, President Biden wrote one when he was vice president. I'm trying to think of current, President Clinton wrote one. So mo almost all of the more current presidents wrote an autobiography or a memoir of some sort. My grandpa never did. And I think, I mean, I know it was slightly intentional. You know, he wanted to make sure that somebody else ju judged his legacy. He wasn't going to write. And I think it has to go back to humility. Like he just couldn't write about it, but he did publish all of his letters. And I think my grandpa, Harold and Jenna were the same way. They were really humble people. My grandpa was a house builder. My grandma, Jenna lived in the same home that he built for my grand for my mom and for her um, until she had to move into the retirement community. She didn't graduate from college, but she was a lifelong learner. She went to community college in, in Midland, the Midland Community College, till she couldn't drive anymore um, because she couldn't see. And so I think, you know, I I just sort of have learned everything from them. Um, and I, when my grandma Jenna died, I said to my mom, I said, do you think that Pa and Grammy ever were sort of overwhelmed with the fact that like you married somebody whose dad was the vice president of the United States because they were really humble people. And 
but at the same time, you know, they were confident. And my mom said, no, Grammy wasn't the type to be intimidated. You know, she didn't look at somebody that had more money or, you know, traveled more. My grandma didn't really get to travel um, and think like, oh, they're better than me. And of course, my grandparents would never make her feel that way. But I think not only have I gotten sort of my love of writing and definitely reading, I mean, all of my grandparents, my grandparents um, and my mom obviously was a librarian or avid readers, um, but I've gotten almost everything from them. You know, I, I just, all four of my grandparents have taught me how to live. And now I want to cry. See, you can cry even on the <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're hitting us all in the fields right now, so uh, we appreciate that. So, so the thing was, is while we were, you know, researching uh, for this interview, I, I did not know that you, uh, you and your sister, penned a letter to uh, Sasha and Malia Obama uh, yeah. as they were transitioning into the White House, and I thought that was pretty amazing. And, and so, uh, what you know, what inspired you all to kind of share those words of wisdom with Sasha and Malia? Yeah, well. We first, not only did we write them a letter to begin with, um, my mom called Mrs. Obama and said, you know, and they're, they're, they're very similar in some ways in that they both wanted their priorities when they started as first ladies for their children. You know, Mrs. Obama and my mom were exactly the same in that way. They wanted to take care of their girls. So my mom knew that especially with little kids, I mean, we were 18, so we at least were off at college. Um, but still, you know, my mom worried most about sort of us adjusting and, and all of that. And she knew that Mrs. Obama would feel that same way. So she called Mrs. Obama and said, you know, would you want to come early before the inauguration and show the girls their rooms and have my girls show them around so that they feel more comfortable. I mean, they, think about it. They were leaving their little girls, moving into the White House, leaving all their friends. And I know it seems like that's something every kid would want. It also can be overwhelming, you know? And so I was a teacher at that point in Baltimore, Maryland, and my sister lived in New York. So we both took the train and took the day off of work and came and showed uh, Malia and Sasha around, showed them all the stuff that, that, we loved as little girls and what makes us connect with them in so many ways is that one they're you know two sisters just like us but also they started you know they became the president's daughters the same age that barbara and i were they first saw the white house the same age that barbara and i were when our grandfather became president so we knew kind of like you know we saw ourselves in them we knew all the funny fun stuff that little kids would do and so we wrote them a letter because we also knew the the privilege of living history, which is, you know, significant. I mean, we got to travel all over the world, like probably, you know, many of you, we got to go to the Africa for the unveiling of PEPFAR, which was the president's emergency relief for AIDS in Africa, and, you know, meet tons of people whose lives would be changed by the um, gifts of, from the people in the United States. And so not only did we get to, you know, live history here in the United States and travel with our parents there, but we got to really open our eyes to the way that people lived around the world. But we also knew, um, and this is why we wrote them the letter, that it's hard, you know, when you're a kid and people criticize your dad, you know, and, and it comes with the territory and it's going to happen and we need a free press because, you know, everybody has to be held accountable. But as a little kid, um, you know, you don't really understand why somebody would write something that doesn't align with how you think of them. And the problem is nobody's going to write about them the way you think about them because they're not their kids. Do you know what I mean? Like nobody's going to yes. write, nobody's going to know how it feels to be in that relationship. So nobody's going to write in that way. And so you kind of have to just know, know that and know, you know, who your dad is. And that's how we sort of ended the letter. You know, you know, your dad, you know what it felt like to be his child and he knows what it feels like to be your dad, but nobody is gonna know him like you do. So kind of take that for a grain of salt. So that's why we wrote them a letter. But, um, you know, and then we went on to write another letter when they grad when when they were leaving the White House, really it's just like a rallying cry to let them be. Um, and and they, ha you know, people have, They've I feel like they've gotten to grow up 
and um, and start their own lives and kind of you know stay out of the papers. And I think that's all that their parents wanted because it's not the it's not the kids who decide to run for president, you know. So it shouldn't be, you know. I think kids should be allowed to be left alone and and start their own lives. Yeah, yeah. Th there's a lot of parallels to uh, what military children have to deal with. Yes. Um, you know, uh, being uprooted, uh, leaving yes. your friends, going into a new environment, traveling the world, meeting all kind of different folks, and uh, that can be tough. Uh, so that, yeah. that's awesome that and you also, and your sister. But also, it's not the choice of the kids. You know what I mean? Correct. So it can be tough because it's, you know, I'm sure it's in some ways the kids are like, wait, but I didn't choose this life, you know? And so when they have to leave or move to a different school, although I will say I went to seven different schools um i traveled you know we moved a lot and 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 i think it's sort of different now like people are like well what is best for your kids and of course you think about that and i'm sure my parents thought about that but i will say there's something about moving around that allows you to become really resilient adults um, i mean i had my sister which was awesome because i felt like you know we we moved in the middle of seventh grade which i'm sure many of y'all are like yeah that's you know par for the course but se we all know middle school sucks you know it's a hard time yeah, yeah. <laughs> to move in the middle of middle school and we went to all sorts of schools we public high school public elementary school we lived in dc and dallas and austin several different schools in dallas but like i, I don't regret that now I mean, I, I feel like I have the confidence a lot from that to, to be braver than I probably would be just by nature, you know, like I'm, I'm, it forced me to be resilient and to be kind of okay with change, which we all know that change is hard and especially like long transitions can be really hard. But I think because, you know, I dealt with it as a child, I knew how to kind of just know, okay, well, we can do this. I have my sister, we can do this like that. So for any of you parents that are feeling, you know, worried about that, I, and my husband went to the same school from like basically preschool through 12th grade. And he's always says, I'd so much rather, you know, the life that you had, because it allows you to sort of think bigger um, and also not be held back by limitations. So I, Anyway, I hope that gives some of you some relief because I know my mom felt sort of bad about having to move us around, but it, it turned out okay. And Jenna, your grandfather, President George H.W. Bush, fought in World War II, and you're a huge supporter of America's armed forces. In fact, your father has supported the Wounded Warriors Warrior Open yeah. Golf Tournament, which side note, I have um, gotten the opportunity to go twice and oh, um, I learned that I learned that one of them, your dad is very big on punctuality because <laughs> apparently, apparently someone was so nice. I wanted to meet. Um, well, I'd love to meet you in person, too, but I yes. wanted to meet um, President George W. Bush so badly. And um, my mom coordinated to, to make it happen. And I got distracted by the free buffet inside. Um, and I didn't realize that your dad was actually waiting on me. And by the time I came out to the golf course, he spun around so fast, pointed to me, and I'm in the crowd, and he goes, Emily, you're late. Oh and my ever gosh. since then, I've, I, am, I do my best I to never be late again, because your dad. <laughs> I wanted to do a public apology for him. Yes. No, it was the best. It's exactly what it's I needed. Best, like it's obsessed with punctuality to the point where it's like <laughs> if you're if you're not early, and I'm not talking about like ten. Like that's why I was like, I'm so sorry if I'm a little late. And then I looked at the clock, and I'm like, but I'm on time. Why do I feel so bad? And I'm like, this is my father. He this weekend when we were in Dallas, we were meeting for lunch at 11:30. At 11.10, he texts my sister and me and he said, we're downstairs, y'all are late. I'm like, but dad, you said 11.30, but we should know <laughs> that when he says, you know, and by the way, you, Emily, you probably weren't late. I bet you, you weren't late. I bet you, you were not early and that equals late to him. <laughs> but, but it was I the best. 
It was the best, and it's probably something he doesn't remember, but I will carry it forever. It was the best experience of my life, and I, like, I don't get distracted by free food anymore. I know I'm supposed to go somewhere. I don't care if there's a free buffet, but I um, I did want to... I guarantee you, you were not late. I bet you, you were just not 15 minutes early, which is like his. Well, now I know to to be, if if I've ever given the opportunity. I work with Hoda Kotb, who's the same exact way. She said that to her parents, you know, she was raised that way. And and I was too, but, you know, and and Hoda will be like, we'll say that we're going to meet downstairs somewhere at like three o'clock. And I'll be, you know, getting organized or something. And she'll call me from the car at 2.30 and say, you ready? And I'm like, hold on. <laughs> if you want to leave at 2.30, just tell me. I'll be there. I promise I'll be on time. But 30 minutes early does not equal on time. So anyway, that's something. Right. I'm sorry. I hope he didn't make you feel bad. He just can't help it. No, not at all. It's the, It truly is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I was like, oh, well, you got a picture with him? Well, I got called out on being late. So one point for me. No, it was best. So yes, and I know that he painted, um, and I have that book as well, because he actually painted a good friend of mine, Jay, yeah. but he did a yeah. lot of oil paintings of wounded warriors. And so um, with your father and grandfather's influence, um, how do you, your contrib- oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so excited okay. about telling you the story. Like, how do I contrib- yeah, to the military, yes. <laughs> yes. The one thing that, um, he, yes, he painted um, uh, wounded warriors and that, that suffered from, you know, invisible, invisible wounds. And he and my mom will spend the rest of their lives supporting um, all of our American heroes because it's just like, you know, to them, it's the most important way that we can give back. And I feel that immensely, too. And so he, you know, he wanted to paint them and tell their stories because he felt like they needed to be honored. Um, and I think some of those paintings are really beautiful. I wish we had some to show you here, but but I'm sure you can Google, Google it and look it up. And I think he also wanted to write their stories, but I think the, the portraits with the stories are really beautiful. And then um, I, so yeah, I wanna make sure that I continue to follow in their footsteps and work with the Wounded Warrior Project. There's so many organizations um, that are making sure that we aren't forgetting about the people that have helped us stay free, you know? And um, one of the things that I got to do, and we did it sort of as a little fundraiser, was to, my grandpa um, was a avid skydiver with the blue, I wanna say the blue knights, but no, with the golden knights. I'm sorry, am I saying it right? Now I'm like losing my mind. <laughs> I'm not of dawn. Am I saying it right? Do y'all know? You know, the, the the army group that jumps out of airplanes for fundraisers yeah, and stuff. Yeah, is the, it the golden knights. The golden knights, okay, good, so I did. I don't know why I'm second guessing myself, but my grandpa always jumped with them. Um, and the reason why he did that is because he hit his head um, jumping out of the airplane when his plane was shot down. Um, And several of the other people that were on the plane didn't live. And he thought had he had a clean jump, he could have saved their lives. I don't think many people know that that's why he was such a skydiver, but he he always wanted to try that jump again. And then I think, so he did it, I think when he turned 70 or 75, and then he just continued to jump for all of these milestones. And so um, when the, the Golden Knights asked me to jump last year, and it was to raise awareness for this military museum that just opened in Washington, D.C. And it was supposed to open right before March of 2020, which, of course, you know, was the worst timing because nobody was going to museums. And so we did a jump to kind of celebrate all that the Army has contributed to our country in this incredible museum, which if you haven't been to, um right outside of washington dc it's incredible and i think it's like the museum of the armed forces i need to get the exact name but we i you know was like oh my gosh i'm gonna jump out of a plane it's not something i really thought i would do and i was kind of like it was very strange this was last summer i sort of like kind of didn't think about it like i would talk about it on the show and then i would compartmentalize it because i was like the more i think about this the more i'm going to be like why did i do this and i would say that like like, why am i doing this like i can't believe i'm doing this and then i got to the plane 
and the Golden Knights had a replica of the plane that my grandpa flew in World War II. It had Barbara oh, wow. on it, which was the name of his plane after my grandmother. And I didn't know that. Like I was totally, and it was early in the morning and I kind of was like, why am I doing this? And then I looked and I saw that and I was like, oh my gosh, of course, that's why I'm doing You know, I, I all of a sudden felt empowered. And the whole reason we did it was to raise awareness and also raise funds for this incredible museum, which I think storytelling, you know, making sure that we know the legacy of the incredible heroes that uh, fight for our country is really important. So I, yeah, I'll just like my mom and dad, I'll continue to, to stay active um, in this type of work for the rest of my life. Yeah, so we are definitely um, thankful and grateful for the work that your family has done, especially with our military community. And as a reminder for our viewers, everything beautiful in its time is available tax-free at shopmyexchange.com or in select exchange stores now. And also the Superpower Sisterhood is out now. And a special shout out and congratulations to Barbara and baby Laura, aka George, Mila, and Poppy. So excited for you and your family at this time. And congratulations again on your new book, Jenna. Thank you guys so much. It was such a pleasure to talk with all of y'all. I had so much fun. I could have talked on and on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So we're going to do a little house housekeeping real quick. So for our chief chat viewers, this episode will be available on YouTube and Spotify. We can re you can rewatch with your friends or catch up on past episodes. Also, be sure to join us at 11 a.m. Central on May 3rd as we welcome content creator and Air Force Academy grad, First Lieutenant Sam Elcombe, um, and also join us back again 11 a.m. Central on May 17th when celebrity chef and retired Mass Sergeant Andre Rush joins the chat. So Jenna, thank you so when much. Did Andre, when was Andre the, the White House chef? Have you done the research yet? Do you yeah, know? Yeah, he, no. he was with the Obama administration, right? Oh, he was? Yes. Awesome. Yes, yeah. He, He's like, he's got like 40 inch, 40 inch biceps or something, <laughs> something ridiculous. I just uh, saw the so, picture. I couldn't believe how big they were. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to do like three push ups before we have the interview so I can f feel feel like manly or something. But uh, yes, exactly. But, but we appreciate you for, for, you know, giving us some time. We know that you, you got a pretty tight, busy schedule today. Uh, but, you know, you, you spending, you know, the last 45 minutes with us means so much to our military community. Uh, and we appreciate everything that you and your family have done for this country uh, and continue to do for the country. Well, and just, I just want thank to thank you so all of you. I also want to thank all of you, not only the three of you for all awesome questions and engaging in such a, a wonderful conversation, but for all of you watching um, who make our country what it is. Um, you're our heroes. And thank you. Thank you for being part of it. Absolutely. So if you don't mind uh, hanging on, hanging with us uh, till after the chat, uh, we'll say our formal goodbyes. But uh, thank you again. God bless you, uh, you and your family and uh, Chief Chat out. <laughs>